As Trekkies rejoice about Star Trek Picard, now with its second episode released, Whovians are breathing a sigh of relief as the British sci-fi series hits its stride with last week's episode. Spoilers abound in today's show. Aussie TV podcaster and mad Doctor Who fan, Mr. Rob McKnight, joins me on the other side of this. Across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube, this is the eighth season of A Trek Zone Conversation with Matt Miller. And there's a big welcome back to Mr. Rob McKnight. Good morning, Matt. It's great to be here at a time when I was losing my faith in Doctor Who, but uh, last week's episode got me back and uh, it's a happy time with new adventures and new twist. Uh, can you feel the excitement? It is very exciting. It's exciting for Doctor Who and for Star Trek at the moment with Star Trek Picard uh, in mm. second second episode. We've, of course, seen the first three. We're going to dive into that a little bit, but let's start on Doctor Who. Yep. Uh, and, of course, for people playing along at home, you can find Rob on Twitter at Rob underscore McKnight and his podcast, Hat TV underscore Black Box. I'm in the Twitter sphere too, at Miramat86. Rob, as I said, let's dive in. You were telling me mm -hmm. off air... And you just said it there as well, that you were losing a little faith in the series this season uh, after we sort of talked about what we were hoping for in the season back in December. What was uh, what were the things that were um, not quite sitting right with you? I think the episode where we got a lecture on climate change, um, you know, it's not that I don't believe in climate change, but uh, it went against the canon of the uh, the show itself. You know, like we've been to the far to the year five million, uh, and everything was fine. You know, uh, where or was it five billion? I can never remember. I'm sketchy on details, but remember when um, David Tennant went to the future in like episode two, That's and right. the Earth was exploding, and he said, "You never stop to think about the fact that it all works out." Mm. And then we've got Jodie Whitt Jody Whittaker telling us that, well, it's all falling apart. We need to think about climate change. You know what? We, we, we really didn't need that. That message can come across without the actual lecture that we got. And I thought it was being a bit too preachy. There's better ways of getting messages through. Um, I've heard some conversations on, on Doctor Who podcasts where they're talking about the fact everything is rammed down your throat in the Chibnall series, you know, like, oh, we're going up in a tractor beam and the TARDIS is literally being pulled up on a tractor beam. Well, we can see that. You don't actually need to say <laughs> the words. Uh, so I think there's a little bit too much of that. The first episode I enjoyed of this season was the Nikola Tesla episode I thought that was yeah. actually pretty good but otherwise I found the Chibnall era really hit and miss we get great episodes like Rosa Parks and then terrible episodes you know ones that I'll probably never go back and watch again and for me that's a really sad thing but what we saw this week was the game changed he's embraced old Doctor Who which is the first series that he did he didn't want to touch anything from the past and then because I don't know if it was the feedback, he then brought a Dalek back, and this season we're getting a lot of nuds. I'm so happy to see Captain Jack back. That, to me, was a magical moment, and luckily I hadn't been spoiled on that because I watched it as it was airing. I was in the US at the time, and it was fantastic not to have that spoiled. And then, of course, the twist, and obviously we're talking spoilers here, which I assume everybody knows, um, that we have another Doctor, and... That, to me, was amazing, and it's interesting. I heard Rob Irwin on the Doctor Who Show podcast really articulate this really well, and it's something I've been feeling. I haven't fully embraced Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. I'm not really sure of the character. It doesn't have enough authority for me. Even Sylvester McCoy, when he was being um, clownish, still had authority, and Jody, uh, I get that it's more of a flat structure, but with the Doctor, it's not. The Doctor is always in charge. And they talk about mm. this family and the flat structure, but everyone needs to look up to the Doctor. This is the person who has seen it all, who has lived thousands of years. She's just on a completely different level to the people she's hanging around with. So it's not to say she can't learn things from them, but she should always be in charge. And the thing I found, I was thinking... And this is what Rob said on his podcast. He started to get worried about the fact that is he a misogynist because he doesn't like the female Doctor Who or he hasn't uh, enjoyed her as much as other doctors. And it's interesting. I felt the same way until we saw Ruth as the Doctor. Mm. 
And the moment she came on, I believed she was the doctor. Mm. I embraced her. She had that authority that lacks in Jody. And I, to be honest, I think if she had been the doctor from the get go, um, I mean, it would have been a huge stretch because I know there's a part of fandom that not only hates a doctor, but hates black, Doctor, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is just stupid. Um, I, I, a few years ago, someone asked me, and when I say a few years, probably 10 years ago, <laughs> someone asked me, um, would you ever like to see the Doctor female? I was like, absolutely not. And the reason for that at that time was because it had never been set up that Time Lords could change their gender. And so it just wasn't part of how I saw the Doctor. Now, what Stephen Moffat did was fantastic for Chibnall because he set it up that Time Lords could change gender, colour, race. It didn't matter. And so the greatest gift uh, Stephen Moffat gave Chibnall was setting all that up. So by the time it came for the Doctor to regenerate into a woman, it didn't phase me in the slightest. What I then was judging the Doctor on was, is this a good Doctor? You know, we all have our favourite doctors. We all have the doctors we don't like. You know, I wasn't the hugest fan of Capaldi um, as as the doctor. Uh, and I haven't fully been sold on Jodie, but I love, love Ruth. And sorry, I don't know the actress's name and that's why I keep calling her Ruth. <laughs> but I love her as the doctor. And, of course, Ruth played by the awesome Joe Martin. Ah, I knew it was a Joe. I felt it was a Joe, but I, 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 I didn't know the actress's name. But uh, she did a fabulous job and she was so complex. But uh, obviously the first thing I thought was alternate universe, but Chibnall has come out and ruled that out. He said she is canon, she is part of it. So it's going to be fascinating to see where that storyline goes. I'm pretty sure that it was just, uh, maybe it was Matt Smith that said, I'm still not female or something like that. And that's mm. all that needed to be. Yes. Instead of what sci-fi seems to be doing at the moment, um, generally in most shows, in ramming these messages down our throats and sort of being very obvious with getting a point across. I, I think it's fantastic to have representation and everything like that, but obviously the ultimate goal has to be providing entertainment, pr providing great entertainment and um, something we can all get on board with. And as I said, I think that line from Matt Smith, yes, actually set the, sowed the seeds, but what they did with the master slash Missy character yeah. was absolutely vital, I think, in getting the audience along for the ride for a female doctor. Um, some interesting points about Ruth I noticed. Um, the, the way she called it the ship. So that puts her timeline definitely down near the Hartnell era because um, the obviously the TARDIS, he referred to the TARDIS as the ship all the time, not the TARDIS. So it's, and it obviously had that older style control room, or console room. So I, I, I think that's where we're sort of placing her. Is it pre-Hartnell? Well, that has its own issues because Hartnell's TARDIS uh, changed into the police box when he was on earth with uh, Susan. So I'm very, very interested to see where this goes. Did he... Did the Doctor have a whole life cycle before we got to the original Hartnell? So lots of questions out there um, that I'm really looking forward to being answered. And one thing I noticed when I was first watching the episode was the dossier on Lee, his picture was in front of the TARDIS. So... I don't, I don't, I, I did a quick Google to see if other people had picked that up and, and I don't know that it's really been spoken about and probably has in forums, but uh, on first viewing, I was, I remember being really confused because it was, it's only, um, it's not overt and it looks a bit blue, but I saw those distinctive windows and I thought, that looks like the TARDIS. And so um, I, I had no idea where it was going. I had no idea we would be getting another doctor. Um, and when I watched the episode second time round, obviously I was looking out to see if that was right. And it was. He, that photo of him on the dossier that was presented is him standing in front of the TARDIS. So lots of questions about him. Was he a Time Lord? Because he was known um, by the other Time Lord. He had a medal that was the whole reason they found him. Or was he a companion who um, helped the doctor who um, then went and got 
rewarded by the Time Lords. There's so much to this guy, although he did have the same training as Gat. So it would indicate that he's a Time Lord. And this is a Time Lord the Doctor's been intimate with because they were living a human existence on Earth. And why didn't he have to become human? So there's just so many questions out there about these two characters um, that I'm I'm fascinated. And it's the best thing uh, the show has done in years. It's a really confusing time, I think, for, for sci-fi fans because they, there seems to be a lot of fan service going on. Um, it seems that, that this is the way that... that our showrunners are thinking that we want the show. Uh, and I think that in part is a little bit of a vocal minority, maybe screaming from the hilltops about how you can't change things. You can't have a female doctor. You can't be doing all these other things. And of course I'm referring to Star Trek here as well with discovering mm-hmm. Picard um, that they sort of go, okay, well, well let's just, you know, do what we know works. The problem with that is that they're they're making trying to make it different, and by making it different, they're putting in speeches, and they they're not being smart about the sci-fi. Oh, I completely agree. Um, one of the things I was interested in about Picard was the swearing. Yes, and how that's going down with Star Trek fans. I like it. It feels very real, and feels nice that we can live in a more gritty world with Picard. But the fan service is an interesting thing because we're, ta- we're in an era where there are so many options for um, people who want content. You know, mm. broadcasters are facing an onslaught from the streaming services. I mean, Picard is now a streamer. It's not a broadcast show. Um, but Doctor Who is facing a big ratings challenge and it hasn't been hitting the marks and it is falling down. And so the balance you have to find for fans and viewers is – acknowledging what the fans want, but also evolving. If you stay stagnant, it's, it's going to, um, you will die. But the problem is Stephen Moffat probably went too far with the um, wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. (laughs) And I remember my in-laws said they just stopped watching it because it got too confusing. So, you know, and, and I get that ballot. I, I, I get that. I actually do understand that. Personally, I enjoyed it, but I get for a broader viewer that isn't as fanatical about some of us that um, it it gets too much. So you really have to find that balance. Um, I think uh, we we can't judge this new doctor on how it fits and how it's going to serve the viewers until we know the backstory. I think there has to be a balance between fan service and the viewers because the viewers will keep the show alive. And it's interesting, are we getting to the point where Doctor Who's going to need another break. Were there many people disappointed when we had a year off from Doctor Who just recently? After Chibnall's first series, was anyone screaming out, no, we need to go straight into the next series? And I've got to say the break didn't bother me. And there have been times in the past where Doctor Who's taken a break where I've been ropeable, but that time was not one of them. Mm. It it almost comes down to a little bit of franchise fatigue in and and that that term has been used to describe Star Trek uh, mm-hmm. when it when it when Enterprise was cancelled and it went into a twelve year TV hiatus. Um, I, I think there just seems to be something with these. Uh, existing franchises, Star Wars as well. I mean, we could. There's a whole podcast in in how Star Wars <laughs> tried to do things, and and interestingly, it's it's these fans, the the vocal minority, I like to call them, because they really aren't all of the fan all of the fandom but they're the ones that jump on twitter and and uh, and rant from the hilltops and and just rant but twitter is not really. indicative of real life we all get on our this high horses true. on twitter but it's a show could be number one trending a tv show can be trending number one on twitter yet won't win the ratings so twitter is not representative of the broader audience it, twitter is niche it's um people talking to like-minded people generally yeah. um and the fact is there's no greater discussion sometimes, although sometimes you can get a good discussion going on and actually have a reasonable discussion and um, debate with people. But you get that section, which luckily on my feed, I tend not to get the those um, misogynists and racists and all that kind of stuff. Um, if I do, I just pretty much move on from them. But um, it's really not representative. 
It's where I go to feed. I'm one of those people. I like to, uh, you know, try and have an argument with them and then uh, last a day and then mute them and move on. Because if you block them, they win. But yes. but it, but it's that sort of thing, and it's it's looking at that. And and as you say, that the the show has to shows Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who. They all have to appeal to that broader audience to bring in the new viewers. The, yes. The, the, the shows can't rely on the existing fan bases. Uh, and I that's feel like where- Picard was doing that, though. Um, you know, like, I found the first episode, and I feel I, there are things I'm not getting about that first episode, um, some of the references. You know, like, I watched every episode of Voyager, not so much Deep Space Nine, so I'm a Star Trek fan who di- dips in and out. I, I certainly wouldn't be worthy of being a, called a fan compared to the people listening to this podcast shall we say, I actually had every VHS of Voyager (laughs) and started to get Voyager fatigue because there wasn't any development. You know, like every time they ran into the Monster of the Week, the ship was repaired again and they moved on. It wasn't until uh, the seventh series, I think it was, that it actually started to, knowing it was the last, that it started to actually um, feel like they were trying to think about the fact that they've been in space, they've taken a lot of damage, um, it's not so easy to repair. You've got no spaceport docking stations you can go to. But I think that is the thing people are wanting from these shows now is to is development. Picard's mm. giving us that, but on the flip side, it's also a little bit complicated. And there's backstory that I think will work in Picard that I'm not getting the full ramifications of, if that makes sense. There are episode lists that are coming out and, uh, it, you know, or certainly for the start of it where it was, okay, you've got to watch these 10 hours of previous Star Trek to understand the nuances of what's going on. And I think that's a little bit of yes. maybe flipping uh, too far the other way from Discovery mm-hmm. um, to, to bring these people back in. And then, of course, we're actually enriching the world and showing civilian life in Star Trek, which is hardly ever seen. Uh, and and I'm loving that fact. You know, I'm loving yeah. seeing Picard in normal clothing and um, I, I actually am loving the uh, the idea of people just – the the transporters that are on the path and people are just coming and going like it's like it's nothing this is daily life on earth Mm. i'm loving all that but it comes back to that thing we've mentioned a couple of times now and it's balance it's the balance between servicing fans and servicing viewers and they're using picard as a big um draw card for cbs all access and out here in australia amazon prime so um and as they should they've already commissioned a second season it's generated so much um so many headlines and so much interest but they need to make sure that viewers aren't like me aren't going to come in and go i I really like it picard but i'm just confused i felt like the third episode which as you said we've both seen is getting back on track with that so i thought the first two um probably indulged a little bit uh Mm. and there was certainly sentimentality which was great and I, i didn't mind some of that but it's um, the plot was a little confusing at times, and maybe I'm a simpleton, <laughs> so uh, maybe I was jet lagged when I was watching it in the states. But uh, I really, I, I genuinely loved episode three, and that's when I was like, I'm so in with the show, and I will watch it through. And episode three is where we get characters who will become the main form, and it's taken three episodes to meet these people. Yeah, which is very similar to how Discovery really went too. I mean, the right. the, the, the two part pilot had really nothing to do with the rest of season one or in fact the rest of the series except for building up that Michael Burnham was a little bit of a rebel um you know and and that that was suffering in for three or four showrunners in the space of uh, 16 episodes yeah really shone uh, showed through on discovery um but that doesn't work no you need a vision yeah. You know, uh, Ricky Gervais always mentions a quote that I just love and embraced and it fits television to a T. Um, the quote is, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Meaning you got this, someone had this beautiful idea for a horse. A, a horse is a beautiful creature. But when everyone else gets in a, into a room and starts adding their two cents worth, that vision loses sight. And you end up with humps because it needs water and this and that. And this beautiful design turns into a camel. And and I use that analogy in television a lot because I see it happen a lot. You have someone with a vision of what the show should be or what this idea should be. And then people meddle 
and you lose that original spark. Now, that's not to say one person has all the answers, but if you end up with fighting against that original vision, you don't end up with this wonderful product. And, and it, it, it is a case time and time again. And in and, and sometimes we've seen that with Star Wars, you know, um, I, I think Solo should have been one of the most exciting films to come out of Star Wars, but it wasn't. But on the flip side, Phantom Menace, I think, is one of the best Star Wars film and we know, films, and we know that went through a lot of rewrites and a lot of reshoots. Mm. So it is a crazy time, I, I think, for broadcasters that are trying to jump into this bandwidth of streaming. Uh, they're trying to catch up. They're trying to, I, I guess stay with the cool kids and 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 have these shows out there um bbc it's it's very interesting to put picard with doctor who doctor who is still on traditional medium picard on the new medium mm. um but still being treated as a broadcast asset really with a weekly release um and things like that um well cbs are making a big play with cbs all access the problem for australian broadcasters is that they don't have the power of the mm. u.s um of the US companies. The only um, channel or network or company to do it with any real success is Channel 9 with Stan. I mean, the ABC obviously has iView, like the BBC has iView, but it's it's a different kind of model because it's part of the um, public's broadcasting service and it's free for everyone, whereas Stan is a model that is trying to stand up on its own. And I think Nine have done a Channel Nine have done a fantastic job with Stan. The problem for Ten and Seven, and for people listening internationally, those are our uh, linear broadcast services. Um, content is now king, mm. and that's why CBS are owning and really developing Picard because it's all about content and having the rights to that content. And uh, for a lot of Australian broadcasters, they don't own the content. And so uh, that's why Channel 10 All Access is struggling because Channel 10 in Australia is owned by CBS, of course, uh, but Picard is not on 10 All Access. They've taken the money and sold it to Amazon Prime Video in Australia. So they're not even getting the flow on support of having a big name show. Picard for Channel 10 would have been a game changer oh, yeah. in this country and they've missed a real opportunity there. So, um, and this is what all the broadcasters around the world faced when Netflix first started. They were selling the content and making a fortune and just basically helping to build Netflix up into one of the biggest yeah. brands in the world. Yeah. And now every network around the world is trying to play catch up and how do we compete? We've got CBS All Access. Disney Plus was such a strong brand that it's going to, it's just got such a back catalog, but that's a, that's the point. They own the content. Yeah. So for companies like NBC and um, uh, HBO, which are all launching streaming services in the US, it's going to be a harder play for them when you don't own all the content because you have to buy it. But CBS, I think, have been smart using a brand like Picard and um, Patrick Stewart is much loved. It ticks all the right boxes. Like if you're, it, it could have been designed by an accountant to say, well, we've run the numbers and if you make this show, this is what's going to drive yes. sales. And and really, uh, Picard is that show. Mm. And it is interesting to look at uh, CBS All Access's Australian cousin, 10 All Access, uh, in, mm. in some of the things that I've been hearing, um, that a lot of it has been because of you know, the rights deals that were signed up to make Netflix and Stan as big as they are, uh, especially in Australia. Um, and the hope is, and the rumour is, that a lot, of, a lot of those deals won't be renewed uh, and that 10 All Access will start bringing in-house uh, its, essentially, its original content, uh, exactly the way Disney did. Disney had uh, the licence with, or Stan had the licence for Disney content here in Australia, and when Disney Plus launched, they didn't renew that lease, and now Disney are taking in the profit from their content. And that's really what this is all about. This is what this all boils down to at the end of the day, business decisions, as you say, most likely made by an accountant. <laughs> the other problem is that uh, when new shows are commissioned by CBS, let's use CBS as the example, they can put in a clause for worldwide distribution deals as far as putting it on their streaming services around the world. 
What they can't do is unless that clause is in the contract, they have to put it to the open market because uh, every show is usually made by a production company and there's profit participation for actors and producers and, and, and showrunners and all that kind of stuff. And there have been cases in the past where um, networks have sold a show to one of their um, companies at a lower price uh, because, you know, it's like, well, we want you to have it. We're not selling it to anyone else. You can have it at this reduced price, which saves your budget. And they've actually been taken to court over that because that's had a flow on effect where the profit participation deals haven't been um, uh, as high as they should have been. And so that's why you will often see 10 aren't just able to pick up all the shows that CBS All Access have. Now, as they go forward, and if CBS as a company decides that they're going to do worldwide deals, which is what Netflix is doing now. Netflix is saying, if you want to make a show on Netflix, we've got to have the right to distribute it on Netflix everywhere. So that profit participation issue won't be an issue going forward for Netflix and isn't an issue going forward for Netflix. But it's everything made before people started putting that in place that's mm. an issue. Now, why isn't Picard on 10 All Access? Well, they obviously didn't put the clause in and uh, as one point, but two, they may have actually decided to try and recoup some of the cost. If they give it to 10, they make no money. They sell it to Amazon Prime Video in Australia and other territories. They will make money, which will go against the cost of producing that program. But then where does that leave 10 All Access if it's having to fight itself and doesn't have the budget to match a prime Amazon video? It's very tricky and lots of business decisions to be made. And Picard is showing us that you can use a big brand to sell the product. CBS All Access um, ha has attributed growth on that platform to mm. the launch of Picard. Just as they did with the launch of Discovery as well. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's this brand that is driving people as much as and here I come back to the vocal minority, as much as they complain that they have to subscribe to to watch the show, people are doing it and, and record numbers of people are doing it. And of course, the big caveat here that I should say is that uh, I, uh, I do work... Uh, I do do work for Channel 10. Uh, as we're I know usually about. we're not allowed to talk because I run a TV gossip website. So this is highly, <laughs> highly unorthodox. Uh, it is the way that it is. Uh, I wish that it was on 10 All Access because uh, I would see posters in the office and it would be fantastic yeah. to be able to see yeah. that on, on something that I work for. Uh, by extension, it sort of is there as well. And, and I got an email from Patrick Stewart the other day. It went out to all CBS staff inviting us to watch Star Trek Picard. So that was nice. But Oh, wow. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I think it was a pro forma email, probably from marketing. But <laughs> let me have this he, one. No, you you take that. <laughs> <laughs> it came from Jean-Luc uh, at CBS.com, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I uh, – just talking about Discovery, it's interesting. I love – the first season of Discovery and then the moment they went into the parallel universe I actually lost interest completely and I actually haven't gone back to it yet oh, so um, yeah it, it's interesting how that plot development just I went oh, it was going so well <laughs> I don't know why it really just annoyed me and I just went if you're doing that as a plot device I'm out Fugitive of the Jadoon I think is part one there's definitely a part two coming next week surely uh, I don't think it's next week. I think that's a longer term play that oh, will come on, lead us to the finale. To yeah. A lot of it will come together at the end of this season. Jack will be back. Will they give us the whole thing about the Time Lords and the other Doctor? I think um, I think they're building up to this big play that could be over two episodes. That's my pick for how it's going to play. So we're going to go a few episodes where it's back to story of the week and then it'll all come together. And, of course, we've completely ignored, and rightly so, uh, the third episode of this season, uh, which was, of course, that vacation planet that wasn't a planet that was a... Oh, well, we did talk about it, the, the climate change uh, speech. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and, and just doesn't play off anything we no. know about Doctor Who. You know, like um, where climate change caused humans to turn into those monsters. Why didn't they just get a ship and bugger off into the stars? You know, we know humans have gone just about everywhere and slept with just about everything. So, um, <laughs> you know, like it, it, that's, that, I, I probably will never watch that story again. 
Alrighty, Rob, uh, thank you very much for talking Who, Discovery, Star Wars, <laughs> Picard, and also diving into the uh, economics of uh, streaming platforms here in Australia. Be careful what you wish for, man. <laughs> you know what? You know what? If I ever need content, I'm coming back to you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Good to talk to you. Absolutely, Rob. Uh, thank you. And we will talk again uh, probably by season's end of, uh, of Doctor Who. Fabo.